Um, so we're going to be moving on to the contributed talks. So Melanie Weber is a PhD student at Princeton University as is going to be presenting her work on learning robust classifiers in hyperbolic space. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Mansil Sahir, Ankit Ravat, Aditya Menon and Sanjeev Kumar who are all at Google Research. And the corresponding paper is going to appear in Europe's this year and can be found on archive. So first, let's let's talk about why would we represent um, data in hyperbolic space. Um, so if we uh, compute an embedding of a data set in continuous space, uh, a, a good embedding would mean that we preserve the similarity relations in the data well, uh, which means that similar entities should be close by and dissimilar entities should be far apart. Um, and uh, a good embedding can be achieved if the geometry of the embedding space aligns well with the intrinsic geometry um, of the data. Um, so one example is if we look at a hierarchical data set, um, so which looks uh, conceptually like the, like the tree uh, we see on the right hand side, um, and we go down the levels of the tree, the number of vertices that we encounter um, grows as two to the k. Um, so this is evidence of a, a exponential volume growth. Um, so if we want to find a good embedding space for a data set with exponential volume growth, um, hyperbolic space um, is a good candidate because it has exponential volume growth as opposed to, for example, a Euclidean space that only has a polynomial volume growth. Um, this, this fact has been um, known for a while. It can be proved mathematically uh, rigorous. And in uh, recent years, uh, that fact has uh, given rise to a lot of interest in um, hyperbolic embeddings for data um, since in like machine learning and AI, we encounter uh, lots of hierarchical data sets. Um, most work in that area has focused on uh, learning good representations, uh, not so much on um, performing actually downstream machine learning tasks in such spaces. Um, and the, the existing work is mostly empirical. Um, so at, at least to our knowledge, um, there has been no theoretical an analysis, no theoretical guarantees. Uh, for classical machine learning algorithms in such spaces. Uh, so, but this is our focus in this paper. So we take one of the uh, most uh, classical machine learning tasks, the task of learning a large margin classifier. So we wanna learn a separating hyperplane um, for a binary classification task. Um, in Euclidean space, this is of course a, a very well studied problem. Um, we are all familiar with the classical perceptron um, algorithm, which is illustrated on the right hand side. Um, so if we want to take this algorithm and look at the equivalent algorithm in hyperbolic space, how do we translate the, that algorithm into hyperbolic space? What we uh, want to learn in hyperbolic space um, is a Euclidean hyperplane as is shown here in red. Um, and what is shown in gray is the hyperbolic manifold. And then our decision boundary corresponds to the intersection of that hyperplane with the hyperbolic manifold. Um, I should say that like in this talk, um, I'm only going to consider the Lorentz model of hyperbolic space. So for everyone who is uh, familiar with hyperbolic geometry, there are different models uh, which are equivalent, meaning that we can isometrically uh, map between those models. Uh, so everything I'm saying and all the, the theoretical guarantees translate um, equally, for instance, to the, to the Poincaré model. But um, let's stick to the Lorentz model. So if we want to translate the update of the uh, Euclidean perceptron uh, to hyperbolic space, we have to make um, a couple of adjustments due to the different geometric setting. Um, so in particular, the Minkowski product um, replaces the Euclidean inner product, um, since it's, uh, in a sense, the inner product in hyperbolic space. Furthermore, we have to add a normalization step. Um, meaning that we have to ensure that our updated classifier um, always stays valid. So we want the intersection of the Euclidean hyperplane that characterizes our classifier and the hyperbolic manifold uh, to be non-empty. And by inserting this normalization step, we can show that our classifier will always remain valid. Um, we then also perform a theoretical analysis of the hyperbolic uh, perceptron algorithm in particular, we show that uh, we need on the order of one over sine h of gamma steps to achieve a margin of gamma. Um, here, the margin is measured 
with respect to a, a geodesic distance um, as opposed to a Euclidean distance in, um, in the Euclidean setting. So geodesic distance um, means that uh, our, our data points, our features are now points on a manifold and uh, this geodesic distance between them is the length of the shortest path um, along the manifold. Building on that uh, hyperbolic perceptron algorithm, um, we look into the robust large margin learning problem. So, so far our algorithm um, can only learn a separating hyperplane, um, but not necessarily the one that achieves the largest margin. And we also haven't made any statement yet about robustness. So in, in order to develop an algorithm for that, we consider an adversarial approach. So we want to compute adversarial examples and use those to enrich our training data set. Um, and then we um, consider two update rules for updating our classifier. Before we dive into the algorithm, um, just a few words on uh, the, the kind of loss function that we're looking at. Um, so we are looking at a robust loss of the following form. So this has like a min max structure where the, the outer optimization problem uh, minimizes the loss over the training set. And then uh, the inner optimization problem uh, considers adversarial perturbations on the hyperbolic manifold. Um, so here DL is the geodesic distance in the Lorentz model and um, alpha is our adversarial budget. So this means this is the maximum amount that we can perturb uh, a point in the training set on the manifold. And then for L, we consider um, a couple of different notions of, of loss. Uh, those are in spirit um, similar to the, the corresponding loss functions in Euclidean space, uh, just adjusted for the, for the different geometric setting. So in each um, step of the algorithm, we take a subset of the training data set um, and then co compute adversarial examples for each of those um, points in, in the subsample. Um, if we don't, don't find an adversarial example within the budget, we just uh, move on. But most of the time we will find um, an adversarial example. Then we add those to the training data set and update um, our classifier over the enriched training data set. So how do we compute adversarial examples um, in hyperbolic space? Um, as a reminder, in Euclidean space, uh, we would compute a perturbation with respect to the L1 norm or L infinity norm. Um, in hyperbolic space, we have the additional difficulty that we have to ensure that we stay on the manifold. Um, so our line five in the algorithm um, reduces to a subroutine of, of uh, this form. Um, so if we look at that, uh, this is a constrained Riemannian optimization problem. So at first we would think this is uh, quite hard to solve, especially multiple times um, in each iteration. But it turns out that we can uh, rewrite this subroutine as a Euclidean linear program. So here A, B and C look like a, a little more complicated than is written here, but in, in principle, that's the form of the Euclidean linear program. And then um, fortunately this can be solved in closed form. So while originally this this looked like a, a really tough subroutine to solve. This can actually be computed very efficiently. So now that we have um, a good approach for computing adversarial examples, um, let's talk about different classifiers. So we first want to consider an adversarial gradient descent. Um, so we have a, a classic gradient descent update. Um, we've probably all seen um, update rules of that form. Um, so with that update rule, um, we can show that our algorithm is efficient. So it achieves, um, uh, it, it converges in, in polynomial time. Um, the, the proof of that is quite lengthy and technical. So I, I can't present too many details of the proof. Um, I just wanna show like one um, critical increment of the proof, um, namely the analysis of something that we termed the adversarial perceptron. Uh, so before analyzing the, the full adversarial gradient descent, uh, we considered an adversarial enriched uh, hyperbolic perceptron um, and performed an, an, uh, an analysis of that. So we derived a sample complexity. Um, this relies mostly on um, geometric arguments um, on utilizing the geometry of the, the hyperbolic space. So 
um, it can all be found in, in detail in the paper. Um, and then with the sample complexity for this reduced version um, and some classical tools from um, Riemannian convex optimization, uh, we can then uh, derive a complexity a guarantee for the full adversarial gradient descent. Uh, we also show that it's actually critical to perform adversarial training. So the enrichment of the training data set with adversarial example is critical to achieving an efficient algorithm. Um, to show that we construct a simple binary classification task that would require exponential time to convergence um, if done without adversarial training. We also analyze a second update rule, um, an empirical risk minimizer. Um, again, the update rule should, uh, should look very familiar. Um, the theoretical analysis of that update was quite different from the adversarial gradient descent. It mostly relies on uh, spherical coding in um, hyperbolic space. Um, the sample complexity that we get um, uh, is shown down here. This, this looks like quite complicated, but by um, simplifying it, one sees that this scales exponentially in the dimension of the embedding space. And a similar result is actually known for an adversarial, um, ad adversarial approach with empirical risk minimizer in Euclidean space. Um, this has been derived in a, in a paper by Charles et al. Um, so we have sort of equivalent um, results in both Euclidean and hyperbolic space. Um, so therefore we can uh, directly compare the approaches. So if you think back to our initial motivation of representing hierarchical data um, in hyperbolic space, I, I've on, already said that uh, sort of vaguely, but to be a bit more precise in the, in the actual dimensions required. So if we have tree-like data, um, then that embeds well into very low dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, in fact, you can go as low as um, embedding dimension two um, and achieve a quasi isometric embedding. So almost no um, distortion embedding error. Um, on the other hand, if you uh, try to embed a tree-like data set into Euclidean space, uh, you need on the order of log of the size of the tree um, dimensions to achieve a good embedding. Um, with, with good embedding here, I mean, it, uh, it would still have a significant distortion, so it, it would still not be as good as the um, hyperbolic embedding in dimension two. Um, but for the sake of argument, let's compare two and uh, log of the size of the tree. Um, and then based on that, uh, we can compare the guarantees that we get in both spaces. And we see that the lower embedding dimension actually allows us to achieve uh, superior guarantees in hyperbolic space. Um, and this can be made much more precise, like in the, in the paper, we really uh, rigorously proved that um, and show all the, the required geometric arguments in showing that result. Um, I also uh, briefly want to show some experiments. Um, so these are really only uh, um, validation experiments on small data sets that uh, illustrate the results of our theoretical analysis. Um, so for the adversarial gradient descent, um, what I'm showing you here uses uh, the hyperbolic hinge loss for the other loss functions. Um, we have also some results in the paper. Um, here we show that indeed um, a larger adversarial budget allows us to achieve a better margin. Um, by, um, of, of course, nothing is free. Um, we need a larger training time to achieve that, but we do achieve a better margin. Um, and importantly, we improve over the state of the art. Um, so there's a, a prior work on um, uh, the empirical, so it doesn't give any theoretical guarantees, but it defines a, a hyperbolic equivalent of support vector machines in hyperbolic space. Uh, which would uh, correspond to our approach um, with the adversarial budget of zero. And those are the, the curves shown in, in blue here. So we significantly improve over those. In a second um, experiment, we test our hyperbolic perceptron. Um, so we embed um, a data set which has uh, 3000 data points um, and it's like two subtrees of a WordNet label hierarchy. Um, so it should be separable in, in an appropriate uh, embedding dimension. Um, and we embed the data set into a different dimensional Euclidean as well as hyperbolic space, and then see in what dimension the Euclidean perceptron or our hyperbolic perceptron would achieve a, a perfect score. Um, 
which means it, it achieves a perfect score whenever it is able to um, learn a separating hyperplane. So this would, would correspond to the data being separable um, in that space. And then we see that for the same data set in hyperbolic space, we achieve a perfect score in dimension eight. Um, and this table here only goes to uh, dimension 16, but we see in Euclidean space, we still make a significant um, error. So the, the data is not yet separable in dimension 16, whereas in hyperbolic space, we achieve um, a, a really good embedding with uh, separable data already in dimension eight. Um, so, so with that, uh, to conclude, um, I talked about hyperbolic counterparts of the um, perceptron algorithm and, um, and introduced an adversarial approach for robust large margin learning in hyperbolic space with provable guarantees. Um, and um, I talked about how a lower embedding dimension um, that we would achieve, for instance, for embedding hierarchical data into a hyperbolic space could benefit us in uh, downstream machine learning task and um, motivated that um, it's, it's good to consider a space that naturally reflects the intrinsic geometry of the data um, to achieve superior guarantees in downstream tasks. Thank you. Great, thank you for that very interesting talk. We have a question from one of our panelists. Hi, um, thank you for the nice talk and the nice work. I was wondering if the algorithm converges in polynomial time, even if the data is not separable, where one needs to involve Slack variables like the Slack SVM. Yeah, I should I should have stated that more precisely. Um, so we assume for for that theorem, we assume that the data is separable. I see. Do you think it would be um, generalizable to the Slack cases, or it maybe perhaps future work? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we have we have some ongoing work. Um, nothing, um, nothing that I can uh, cite yet, but it's ongoing work. I, um, I think there's hope that uh, it would translate to um, nonlinear classifiers and maybe even deep classifiers. Thank you. I have a question about the adversarial training. You mentioned the examples need to remain on the manifold. I was wondering if perceptually we can see any differences between these adversarial examples and adversarial examples in Euclidean space. Um, so, sorry, what do you mean with per perceptually? If we visualized adversarial examples either from the hyperbolic perceptron versus a classical perceptron, would we see differences between the two? Would their perturbation patterns be different? That, that's a very interesting question. So I, I, would, I would assume yes, um, since the, um, the, the procedure of arriving at the adversarial examples is very different. Right In Euclidean space, you would just perturb in the norm. Right. Um, and in the in the hyperbolic setting, you have to solve this subroutine. Um, so I, I would assume so, but I haven't looked into it. That's a that's a really good question. Okay. Do we have any more questions for the audience before we move on to the next talk? Well, thank you, Melanie, again. Thank you.